Okay, welcome to week four of our course. Today we're going to be talking about three ways in which we can evaluate the quality of tests and standardized assessments in particular. So we're going to start off with measures of reliability. So what is reliability? And you should remember that from our textbook reading. Reliability is consistency, stability, or dependability. So those are kind of three ways we can think about reliability. Basically, how closely are scores replicable? How much can we depend upon these scores? Um, so some examples. A scale to measure weight gives us very reliable measurements, hopefully, right? So if I had a scale and I stepped up on it and I got a weight and I stepped off and I stepped on it again, I got a completely different weight. I couldn't depend upon that scale. It wouldn't give me reliable measurements. I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't know if I could, if I should eat more or if I should exercise more. I wouldn't have a reliable measurement, right? But we can usually depend upon a scale to measure weight to give us reliable, consistent, dependable results. Alternate forms of the SAT, right? So there's a different SAT test um, every administration if you take it in, in uh, November, it's a different test than in December, but they do a lot of work down at ETS who do, in the College Board who administers the SATs to give us reliable results, right? That we can pretty much depend that the SAT that's given in November is equivalent to the SAT that's given in December. It's not the same test, so it's a little bit less reliable than that scale in the first example, but it's still pretty reliable. Um, but if I gave a multiple choice test to one class and an essay test to the other, I wouldn't consider those two tests equivalent, right? Those wouldn't give us very reliable, reliable results, right? Some kids would do better on a multiple choice test. Others would do better on an essay test, right? So that wouldn't be reliable. That wouldn't give us consistent results. We're going to talk about four types of reliability today. We'll talk about inter-rater or inter-observer reliability. This is one that um, the textbook doesn't talk about, so pay special attention to this one. Then test-retest reliability, parallel forms reliability, and internal consistency reliability. So let's talk about inter-rater or inter-observer reliability. When we're talking about inter-rater or inter-observer reliability, we're really talking about the consistency of scores across observers. So do the people who are rating the test or the scores give similar or the same results? So we think about this, you know, like in the Olympics, right? So they're judging the ice skating, the gymnastics competitions, and always that one Russian judge who always gives a, the American the off score, right? We would like to see that all of those judges are giving similar scores, that we have high inter-rater reliability. Um, we can also, we also think about the inter-rater reliability on things like the FSA or the FCAT. And we can also think about inter-rater reliability within our own scores. So let's say that I'm grading a stack of 100 essays, right? And maybe I'm in a really good mood when I start grading those essays and everyone's doing really great and I'm going along, right? But then, you know, by the time it's 3 in the morning, I'm on the 100th essay that I'm grading. I'm in a really bad mood and those kids are doing really poorly, right? I don't have a lot of inter-rater reliability within myself right? That my mood has changed. I'm not the same person I was at the beginning of this stack of essays as I was at the beginning of this stack of my essays. So I don't have inter-rater reliability among myself, right? So how do I get sources of reliability evidence? How do I, how do I know if I have strong inter-rater reliability? Um, I can look at some evidence of errors upon those scores. So the first one we see is halo effect. And we get halo effect when um, if, I, if I'm in a good mood about a, a student and then, and then so if I have, um, if I have grade a good essay and then that next essay I grade I also feel good about. This is particularly strong if I'm grading all of one test by one person before I move on to the next test, the next person. So essay one by by Susan's really good, so I kind of expect that essay two will be really good. I can prevent that by grading all of essay one for all of my students first, and then going back and grading essay two. I also have some other kind of biases. So things like maybe I just really hate it when people write in purple pens, so I just kind of, you know, grade those lower. I could also have biases based upon, you know, expectations I have of certain students. Um, when I'd want to try to uh, to eliminate that as much as possible, possibly by keeping the names of students anonymous when grading. 
am fatigued, right? We kind of talked about that before. So if um, I'm grading a stack of 100 essays, I'm going to get really tired by the end of it. So I might want to split that out, out over a couple of days rather than trying to grade them all at once. And there's just other idiosyncrasies that I need to acknowledge that I have. And we'll talk more about um, this, these kind of biases when we talk about fairness um, in a couple of lectures from now. Um, and we really want to think about that innovator reliability. Um, it's helpful in the classroom. Um, a, you know, if we have more than one person grading a test, which might happen if we're doing some sort of district um, analysis of essays or um, district-wide evaluations of maybe music performance for my music majors out there, or essay tests or those kinds of things. We might also have this inter-rater reliability um, <clears throat> within our own school if we were trading essays or trading filing exams to grade. Um, but it's probably more important and more relevant when we're talking about it within ourselves and we're grading subjective measures, subjective measures like essay tests or projects, or even as a math teacher or a science teacher if we're grading um, problems that students are solving. Um, the next one we'll talk about is test retest reliability. Um, and this is the consistency of a measure from one time to another. And it's sometimes theoretical. So if I was able to give a test once, and then I was able to give that test again under the same circumstances, so without the student learning anything, without the student um, kind of remembering what was on that test previously. Um, so most standardized achievement tests have some measure of test retest reliability. So we can do this. Um, this is evidence based upon stability of the test, consistency over time. Um, <clears throat> we'd administer this test to a student, wait a specific amount of time, and then administer that assessment to the students. And theoretically, over that specified amount of time, there wouldn't have been learning or teaching happening for the students. We're not measuring growth over time. We're just measuring if the test would be consistent. <clears throat> um, so something to think about here, for younger students, we'd want that that time to be shorter because for younger students we just see a lot of development that happens naturally, right? So if we think about a three-year-old, right, they learn new words all the time just by being out in the world, right? They're just constantly picking up and learning things, but they also kind of have a short memory. So if something they took on a test even a week ago, they might have forgotten by the time you give that test again. For older students, they're less likely to just kind of pick up the types of things that would be on a test in their natural everyday environment. However, they're much more likely to remember the things that would be on a test. So we would need that period of time to be longer for them to kind of not remember what was on the test. So we can wait longer in between administrations for, a long, for longer. For older students, we just want to make sure it wasn't things that were taught to them in the meantime. Now we'll talk about parallel forms reliability. In parallel forms reliability, we're talking about two different versions of the same test. So if we think back to the SAT, the December and November administrations of the same test. Um, a lot of most standardized tests have more than one version. A lot of times we do this to prevent cheating from one version to another. Um, we also use this in research. We might give Form A at the beginning of a project and Form B at the end of a project to show growth over time without students kind of remembering what was on the test and presenting uh, <clears throat> a source of error into our measurements. Um, how do we get evidence of reliability evidence for parallel forms? So based on equivalent forms, um, we administer two forms of the same test to groups of students and then correlate those scores. Um, again, um, in classrooms, we might be using equivalent forms if we give more than one form of a test to students to prevent cheating. So we might even just be um, mixing up the order of the questions or the order of the answer choices on the same form of a, on the test to prevent cheating among students. Um, we also might um, actually have different questions on a test if we wanted to have a makeup test or give different tests to students on A days and B days. And we just want to make sure that those two forms of the test were approximately equal. So we might see where the average scores on the two tests pretty similar which would give us some evidence that they were reliable. However, let's say that all of my honors classes were um, on A day and all of my remedial classes were on B day. Would we expect those two groups of students to have equivalent scores? Of course not. So it wouldn't be our only source of evidence, but we would want to kind of look at those scores to make sure that they were equivalent, right? 
And the last type of reliability we'll talk about is internal consistency reliability. Internal consistency um, looks at the results across items within one test. So essentially we're saying, do all of the items on our test measure the same thing? Are they measuring the same construct, the same idea? Um, we do this a lot with attitude surveys. If, so if we think back to our last module and remember how all of our, you know, four to eight items were supposed to measure the same thing, we might use internal consistency reliability to see, well, did students really answer all of those questions the same? We also do this in content tests to see, well, if all of these items really measure understanding of the Civil War, do they consistently measure this item, <clears throat> this construct the same? This is probably the most conceptually difficult way to measure reliability and the way that's most statistically difficult to construct, um, but also the way in which reliable, reliability is most often reported um, in kind of textbooks and the way it's reported. If like a, if you run across a test that says, our oh, reliability is 0.84, it's most likely referring to the internal consistency reliability of that measure. So again, it's the degree of homogeneity of the scores on items. Um, we're probably not really calculating that internal consistency reliability for our own tests, but it's going to be the idea in which when we get to item analysis in, um, in a few weeks, um, we'll be talking more about this internal consistency reliability. So put a pin in that information. Know that it's important and know that it's how it's most often um, reported if you were going to look up the internal reli internal consistency reliability or the reliability of let's say the tests that were on the standardized assessment <clears throat> um, case study report that you're going to turn in this week um, it'll be reported the internal consistency reliabilities so this is really important we're not going to talk about tests themselves being reliable the test isn't reliable the scores on a test can be consistent or they can be reliable so i'm not going to say the whisk is a reliable test what i can say is the scores on a test are reliable and this is important um, because it really does mean something right so let's say that i gave a let's say that i had a test of numeracy right and i asked um the way I was going to do this is, can you count to 100, right? If I asked all of my high, all of my college students to count to 100, I would get pretty reliable results, right? Like, you guys can count to 100 very consistently. If I asked you to do it today, and again tomorrow, and again next week, all of you would be able to count to 100 consistently, right? So, wow, that's a really reliable test, right? Well, now let's say that I went to a bunch of three and four-year-olds, and I said, count to 100, right? I asked them today, and I asked them tomorrow, and I asked them next week. How likely is it that those three or four-year-olds are going to consistently count to 100 in the same way? I don't know how many of you have worked with three and four-year-olds, but it's not very likely that I'm going to get reliable results. So this, so counting to 100 is not a reliable test, right? It's a reliable test when I'm giving it to college students, but it's not a reliable test. I don't get reliable scores with three and four-year-olds. So it's really important the context. So I can talk about the scores on the test being reliable, but not the test itself, because it depends on the context of the test. Okay, so what causes unreliability? Why are some tests reliable, and why are some tests not as reliable? The scores on some tests not reliable. Well, it all has to do with error in tests. So remember last week when we talked about standard error of measurement? Well, it all comes back down to reliability. So. There's two sources of error. There's internal error. Internal error is error that the student does, right? So sometimes the student guesses correctly, sometimes the student guesses incorrectly, and that causes um, there to be error in that measurement. And then sometimes it's external error. Sometimes there's error in the way in which a test is constructed and the environment in which the test is given. So let's look at some examples of both of these. So sources of error in assessments. So what you can see is we have the actual true knowledge of a student, and we give them an assessment, and then that assessment gives us an observed score. And there's internal and external factors that go into that assessment that gives us that undeserved score. So the actual true knowledge is not the observed score, but there's some mediating factors to that observed score. So this kind of picture here shows us that theory of assessment, that shows us that we have this latent construct, their actual true knowledge or their understanding of a content, 
and we have their observed score, which is only maybe a picture of what we can measure about what they know. And all this error factors into that score. So some internal factors that affect our measurement of, um, of reliability. So we have um, the student's health, their mood, their motivation, um, their test taking skills, their anxiety, their fatigue, and then just their general ability, right? Um, and what can we do to alleviate these factors? So can we affect a kid's health? I mean, aside from giving them, you know, um, antibacterial lotion, right? We really can't affect that. Um, their mood and their motivation, we as teachers can do something to affect those things. When I ask elementary school teachers if we can affect motivation, they're like, oh yeah, we can affect it. And when I ask high school and middle school teachers, they're like, oh no, kids are not motivated or they are, it doesn't have anything to do with us. So maybe it depends on their perspective. Um, but we can absolutely teach test taking skills and part of our job as teachers is to make sure that our students are prepared for those tests. Not that teaching them how to take the test is our only job, but we want to make sure that they know how to approach those test take test items in order to answer the test questions appropriately. We can try to alleviate the anxiety around tests, but some students are going to have more anxiety than others and be more anxious about tests. We can tell students to try to get more sleep before the test, but some you know fatigue is fatigue, and we really can't affect general ability. Um, the external factors that um, that affect a student's performance um, include things like the directions of the test, right? So we, um, if we write the test ourselves, we can make sure that those directions are clear, but other than that, we can't affect it. Um, luck, we cannot affect. Um, item ambiguity, um, we can, if we write the items ourselves, we can try to make them less ambi ambiguous. And we'll talk next week um, about, or in two weeks, about how to write clear items. Um, the heat in the room, the lighting, the environment of the test, you know, sometimes in some schools we can affect that, in other schools we can't, right? Depends on your school district. And the sampling of items. This refers to which items we choose to put on the test. So if I'm going to measure, you know, a student's knowledge of the Civil War, there's an infinite number of questions I can ask about the Civil War. And which 20 questions do I choose to put on the test? That's the sampling of items. Do the 20 questions I choose, is that a good representation of the body of knowledge of the Civil War? That's sampling of items. Observer differences, that goes back to kind of that inner rater reliability and um, how I score the item. Test interruptions, you know, we can try to prevent those and sometimes tests are just interrupted. That scoring, we'll talk about more objective scoring. So things like multiple choice questions are more objective and redu reduce the amount of error and produce more reliable results than more subjective measures like essay tests. And then that leads into observer bias. So how is reliability determined? Um, we estimate that error and the influences of error. So do all tests and assessments have error? Uh, hopefully you were paying attention a few weeks ago. Yes, every measurement has error. So every test we give has some amount of error. Our job as teachers and as test writers and as test administrators and even as people choosing the types of assessments we use in our classroom, we want to try to eliminate and lower that amount of error as much as possible. And where we talked about the standard error of measurement and it's calculated based upon that internal consistency, reliability, and the standard deviation of scores and it gives us that confidence band. So reliability in the classroom, what can we do to increase the reliability of the scores on tests in our classrooms? Um, we can observe the consistency of tests. Um, so are the tests giving us the scores we would expect? Um, are we getting, you know, if we're giving a series of quizzes, are they kind of giving us the types of scores we would expect based upon our observations in class? If I'm giving alternate versions of a test, if I have form A and form B, are the means similar between the two versions? Um, am I using a, if I'm using a scoring guide or a rubric to, to um, grade, um, essays or subjective measures, am I using it consistently? And I should be using a rubric or a scoring guide. Um, if I'm using more than one's grader or score, are they trained together? Am I getting similar scores among them? So some factors that influence reliability. 
the number of items. The more items on a test, the greater the reliability of the scores on that test will be. So I should have at least five items per objective or target or factor I'm trying to measure. The number of subjects. The more students I have taking a test, the higher the reliability of the scores on that objective will be. The difficulty of the items. The more items that I have that are in the middle range of difficulty, the more reliable the scores on that assessment will be. That's not to say that you shouldn't have easy and difficult items on the test. It's just that the more in the middle range they are, the more increase of reliability you'll have, right? And that goes back to the discussion that Popham has in his book about this, right? Um, and the more objective your scoring is, the more dichotomous items you have, the more that your items are right or wrong, the higher the reliability of the scores will be on your assessment. With clear directions, um, will also increase that reliability, it will reduce that error, right? That's not to say that subjective um, items or constructed response items are bad, they're just gonna reduce the reliability. And we'll balance that in our next lecture when we talk about validity. And then clear rubrics. So if I am gonna have subjectively measured items, I wanna have rubrics that are very clear, that outline how to grade them to reduce to reduce the subjectivity, to reduce the error that I have when scoring items. So when does reliability become most important? Am I gonna be concerned about the reliability of scores on every single assessment that I ever give in my classroom? I mean, probably not. It's most important when large decisions are made upon the outcomes of the assessment. So I'm gonna be really concerned of those high stakes tests, you know, state tests, district level tests, final exams, right? I'm gonna be less concerned about the daily work in my classroom, the daily quizzes I'm giving, right? So what are some ways I can enhance the reliability um, for the scores on tests in my class? Um, I should use a sufficient number of tasks. I should use independent readers and observers. I should try to maybe, um, so that I'm not affected by biases. Um, I should construct items that differentiate students on what's being measured and make assessments as objective as possible, continue the assessments until the results are consistent, eliminate the influence of extraneous events, things like avoiding prom night, you know, of the, of the test, um, and use shorter assessments more frequently than a few or longer assessments. And that's going to be a running theme. We want to have fewer um, have more frequent short assessments than fewer long assessments in general. Okay, so that was our discussion of reliability. This week we'll also talk about fairness and validity. If you, as, as always, if you ever have any questions, feel free to email me and we can set up a meeting. I'm happy to meet with you face-to-face -face or on the phone. Bye!